and she will be talking about proof of stake, how to remove MEV. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Hi everyone, thank you for being here. Is it working? Cool. Um, thanks for being here. Um, so because the merge is coming up literally tomorrow, I decided to dedicate today's talk on proof of stake and how to remove MEV. Unfortunately, I'm not as good at <laughs> announcing it as, as the moderator. Cool. And so basically, the, the presentation consists of two parts. In the first one, um, I'm going to explain um, the forces of MEV and proof of stake, and specifically the risks that arise um, from having MEV. And the second part of the presentation will talk about design choices that can help to mitigate or reduce at least MEV, and specifically dive into CAL protocol. Cool, let's start. So to understand um, MEV and proof of stake, you actually have to understand first who are the different actors in proof of stake. And why in proof of work, you had the miners who were responsible to create the next blocks. In uh, proof of stake, you now have the validators. And who can become a validator? Every one of you can become a validator. And all you have to do is basically you have to stake 32 Ether. And um, then you have to uh, operate a node and also run um, an execution and consensus client. And that's pretty much all you have to do. Um, who, how is then selected? Um, who will become the validator to create the next block? And this is completely randomly picked. But there's two things that I want to highlight here. One is, of course, you can increase your chances by running multiple validators. So all you're restricted by, essentially, is the amount of ease that you're holding. So the more ease you have, the more validators you can essentially also operate, if you like. The second point I want to highlight is that also in proof of stake, and this is very different to, uh, to proof of work, um, in the time period of an epoch, you actually know who will become the next validators. So you can know in advance not only who is creating the next block, but also who is creating the next few blocks. So what happens now if one of the actors, if one of the validators is able to extract MEV significantly better than anyone else from the validators? They would, over time, be able to increase more and more the rewards that they're getting, because by not only getting the reward for being a validator, but also by extracting value, um, they're getting more rewards than everyone else. And um, what happens then? They take over a larger share of the network. And that's obviously not great, the centralization risk, because um, validators are the ones who can censor transactions. They can specifically decide what kind of transactions are going to be part of the next block and decide on excluding some uh, if they want to. And so obviously, the uh, centralization of this validator set is not a good idea. So the question is, how can we mitigate this risk? And the answer to this is proposal builder separation. It is something that was two, two talks ago actually just presented also by, by Steph from the Flashbots team. And um, for those who didn't attend the talk, we will quickly sum it up again what the proposal builder separation actually means. It means that the role of the validators is being split now into two different actors. You still have the validator that is proposing the next block. But now you have also builders entering the game who can compete on deciding um, with, uh, basically what transaction payload should be part of the next block. So they basically look at the mempool and maybe private transactions and come up with a set of transactions and order of those um, to design the next block execution payload. And so the validator is selling this block space, and the builders are competing by offering bids on how much they want to pay the validator for their block to be picked. So the question is, is this now really um, solving the problem of centralization? And the answer is no, or at least not really. 
because what happens now is that before you had the centralization risk with the validators, but you now shifted this risk over to the builders. Now it's essentially the builders who have the, um, who have the power over basically um, competing against each other on deciding on what transaction payload will be included. And a risk that arises from this can come from private order flows. So essentially, if you now have a wallet um, that is willing to, um, to say that they are going to forward the entire transaction uh, flow only to one specific builder or to a set of builders, then, um, then this builder arguably has an advantage over other existing builders because they have a wider range of transactions to, to, um, to include and arguably have better chances of winning the competition. Why would a wallet do this? For example, they could say, hey, I'm, I, I'm actually getting paid by the builder, so they, they have a strategic advantage, so they can pay me a little bit for getting my private transaction flow. And... Um, at the, at the beginning, maybe it seems like a good deal for the wallet, but what could happen over time is that the builder gets more and more stronger. They take over a larger uh, set of the network of basically winning more and more of the competitions. And at some point, the wallet is almost forced to send a transaction flow still to that same builder, even if it has become in a way a little bit maliciously, because they still want the transaction load to be included in the next block. So if they wouldn't include, if they wouldn't send their transactions to this builder, they have a high downtime essentially of their transactions not being included in any of the upcoming blocks. And yeah, and so this is in a way it's a it's a, a malicious, vicious circle. Um, so let's sum up the argument so far. Um, MEV is definitely to some extent a centralizing force. Um, the proposal builder separation is to some extent mitigating this, but it is moving over the, um, the risk towards the, the block builders. And maybe one additional point we can make here is um, that searchers and block builders um, are really reaping the benefits of MEV. Like they are the, the two actors that are really like benefiting from MEV. And how it's always the case, if you have winners um, of a competition or like of a game, then you also have losers. So let's dive in to understand who are actually the, the losers of our competition. Um, to understand this, let's look at the MEV su uh, supply chain. And what I mean by this is essentially what happens with an order from its initial creation until its final execution. And of course, you have the users that are basically um, submitting their transaction. In many cases, they do this via an application. Um, in many cases, the application then forwards the transaction directly to the mempool. In some cases, then some searchers are making use of their transactions um, to, to extract some MEV and are collaborating with builders to incorporate these in a certain order in a block. And then the builders compete with each other uh, forward uh, and, and then the, the validator picks a block and then finally uh, executes and proposes the block. So who are the happy stakeholders of this? So we already said that the validators to some extent are benefiting from it and the builders. So the question of who of the two is really benefiting more is like there's two sides of the arguments. You can either argument in, uh, in the one direction where you say theoretically the competition of block builders should be so high that they are not able to um, extract much value for themselves because they have to basically pay a high reward to make to the validator to ensure that their block is being picked. And in this case, the validator is actually the one who's reaping most of the benefits. Or if you look at this argument with the private transaction flow, in that case, you could have a scenario where one block builder has significantly better um, uh, value that they can extract out of the block, significantly better than the second best builder, but all they have to pay is essentially a tiny amount larger than what the second best builder is able to pay. Yeah, and searchers in a way, they, they can be the same um, actor as a builder or it is a, a, a separated uh, um, actor that is collaborating with, with builders together. But in any ways, they pretty much share the rewards that they are making out of MEV. And <coughs> then you have the applications. And this is a little bit tricky. So I would say, I would argue that most of the applications today are neutral. They're basically just forwarding the transactions without um, reaping benefits out of it uh, for themselves. 
they could act maliciously, as we already discussed, if they decide, okay, I just sell the transaction flow to a specific builder. In that case, there would be uh, also some beneficia uh, benef beneficiaries out of, out of the um, MEV. But the only ones who are definitely losing from the MEV competition are the users who are actually the ones who are making sure that the network is being used, and they're the ones who are, who are really losing uh, to this competition, to this game of MEV. Cool. Uh, now that we have established um, what are, are the negative sides of uh, the existing MEV supply chain, let's now try to understand what a healthy MEV uh, supply chain would actually look like. Um, on the one hand, um, yeah, you, you would say that the competition and each and every single step of the supply chain is essentially should have as much competition as possible because the more competition there is, uh, the more the price that can be uh, taken out from the user, taken away, um, should trend more towards zero. And um, on the other hand also, if you were to decide where the value accrual should be lying, you can argue that it should actually really be distributed towards the edges of the supply chain, meaning towards the, the validators and the users, to the validators because they are arguably providing the capital to ensure that the network is secure, and to the users because without the users, there wouldn't be any transactions in the first place. But I am going to argue that ultimately, and then the really healthy supply chain would be a supply chain in which the MEV is not extracted from the users in the first place. Okay, and that leads us to the second part of the presentation, to Cal Protocol, and um, how Cal Protocol chose a design that is really trying to mitigate the amount of MEV that can be extracted. Cool, and yeah, basically, again, where does Cow Protocol lie? For those who don't know, Cow Protocol is a decentralized exchange, so it is lying on the application layer, and by the design, it's purposefully picked. And in that sort of supply chain, the users should actually be the ones that are the happy participants. Cool, but how do we achieve this? So what happens at uh, Cow Protocol is that the participants, the users that are placing a transaction, they are only signing an intent to trade. And these are all collected in an off-chain order book. And then, now it becomes really interesting, we have the Cow batch builders, so to say, who look at the existing valid transactions in the order book and then compete with each other. But on first sight, basically, you would argue, oh, this looks very similar to the block builder competition, but we have two very significant differences. Number one is the users only sign an intent, and this is really important to remember. They only sign an intent to trade. And the second one is that the, um, that the objective function for what our builders are optimizing is very different to the one uh, to that uh, block builders are optimizing for. What we optimize for is the surplus, the utility that is added to the user order trades. So in other words, the more benefits, the better prices our builders can achieve for our users, the more likely they will win the competition. So the one person, the one builder that wins the competition is the one that creates the most value for the users. And in the block builder competition, it's the opposite. It's basically whoever is able to extract most value from the user is the one that wins the competition. Okay, and how do we actually ensure that um, we can keep our uh, cow batch builders honest? Um, for this, it's also very similar to proof of stake. So um, a, a, a cow batch builder, they would stake some tokens. Uh, once they've done this, they can participate in the competition. In case they win the competition, they get some rewards paid out. And in case that they would um, act maliciously, uh, their stake would be slashed. Cool. So, um, looking again where we sit in the entire supply chain or in the entire um, chain between order creation to uh, final order execution, um, you have the users. Uh, they submit their intent to trade. It is collected in an off-chain order book. The um, cow batch servers um, are competing to find the best solution. The one that finds the best solution, basically meaning 
finding the best prices for the users is the one that wins. And then they execute the transaction on chain. And now I also want to highlight two things here. Um, if they, if once that the cow builder has won and is responsible for submitting the transaction on chain, the user price the, is secured because now, if any negative externalities would happen, like MEV, it is actually taken from the cow builder, but the price that was provided to the user is secured. And the reason why we think this is the right thing to do is because you, you cannot expect an average user to be professional and knowing what's the best way to submit transactions on chain. But the cow builders, they're specialized parties who know exactly how to deal with the on-chain environment and they, can, they know exactly what to do, to do to ensure that your transaction is safe. And the second part, um, is basically that in an ideal scenario, there is not even any value to be extracted from your trades. And this is where we get back to the point that the orders that you submit are just signed and tense. So um, looking at this example of this graph, for example, you see that um, there's two people who are both more or less around the same time submitting orders. You have one who is wanting to sell Ether for DAI and another one who's wanting to sell DAI for Ether. So they're not matching 100%, right? Because one person wants to buy 2,000 DAI, the other one only wants to sell 1,900. But 95% of this trade, you are able to match directly against each other. So that means you only have a leftover of 100 DAI that you would actually have to execute via an on-chain AMM interaction. And what the servers then do, they are able to create a single Ethereum transaction and put all the different intents from the users together into one single transaction. Cool. And from having these um, having users only sign a transaction brings a few additional price benefits, like UX benefits to the users. So you don't only have the protection against MEV, you also have protection against failed a transaction cost, they don't have to pay for it, they can submit orders without having to spend any ETH. And um, also, and one of the other benefits that come from the side is that, for example, you don't have to stick to a specific execution path. Um, and that, for example, is very helpful in the context of DAO trading. So DAO for DAOs usually it takes a bit longer until they collect all the signatures to ensure that their execution, that their trade is executed. And by the time that they would be ready, in many cases, the on-chain price point has changed. The initial um, transaction route that was found at time of initial order creation is not the best one anymore, but they would be stuck with it or it might even fail. And in our case, we can always adjust the best uh, execution route uh, route in the moment of uh, order execution. Cool, yeah, and that is basically the, the, the power behind proof of stake. And uh, that's it. We've got about seven minutes for questions. People will probably just ask for another move. Thanks so much for uh, your talk. It was really interesting. Um, here I am. <laughs> so my question is, um, you had one flow chart where it showed user transactions going into the cow protocol, and then those were going into blocks being built. Um, this one? And you have that trophy, right? So does that mean that that block was the most profitable for <laughs> validators or for users? And you know, I guess my secondary question is, um, if you're competing with other block builders that are sending more value to the validators, how are you going to get included on chain if it's not as valuable, right? So, thanks. Cool. Let's uh, let's focus on the first question. Were you asking about the competition between the batch block builders, like the cow builders, or the why they pick a specific block builder? Um, so, just the cow builders on the right side. Okay, yeah, that, that is really optimized. So basically, they are submitting their um, execution route and basically they, what they're submitting is this is like the surplus that we can generate for X, Y, and Z orders. And then there's a competition that's comparing which one of them is finding overall the 
at the maximal surplus that can be given to the users. And this is the one that would be picked. Gotcha. So like the second stage is it gets proposed to the network, to right. the validators. So, right? so you, have, you have then the one that wins the, wins the batch competition, right? And this one is then responsible to submit the transactions on chain. And then your second question, do you have a second question, no? <laughs> well, I guess, I guess I'm just thinking, like, if, if this is maximizing user value instead of the validator value, um, and validators want to make the most they can, um, aren't the validators going to pick, you know, perhaps not the cow uh, protocol? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's a super interesting question, and I think there's, like, different answers to this. So first of all, what is done right now, and I think what a lot of the service do is they still submit via... Uh, Flashbots Protect, which will now be Math Boost, essentially. So they are paying in order to be included. And, um, and then the question is, how could they, for example, afford paying for this? And usually, we are able to generate a lot of surplus for our users, like in the one example where um, you have um, someone um, being able to be matched directly against each other. They save also on gas costs because you don't have to individually send the order on chain. They also save on um, reduced slippage that they incur. Then they don't have to pay the protocol fees for interacting with Uniswap, for example. So there's a lot of like, additional surplus that is generated for the users. And that also, I would arguably, would if servers would have to pay a little bit more in order to ensure that the transactions are included in the next block on chain, give them a little bit of leeway to use that to pay for this extra additional cost without taking it away from the users. Hi. I have two questions after the presentation. So the first one is you mentioned currently uh, the transactions are being batched. So does that cause a latency problem? Second, uh, uh, sorry, let's start with the first one. I forgot the second one. Cool, OK. So actually, that's also a very good question. We currently wait for 30 seconds um, for um, to basically, in order waits, the first order for the next batch is waiting up to 30 seconds to be included in the next batch competition. So in that way, yes, it is creating some latency. However, we are able, this is completely flexible. So you, once we have more orders, we will definitely reduce the time and would probably um, reduce this down up to 12 seconds. So it is equivalent with the, with the block time in proof of stake. Perfect. Uh, I'm, uh, I j the second question just, uh, just came to mind. So uh, they are different kind of uh, aggregators currently on the market, searching the best route. So what exactly is the secret sauce of Cal protocol to offer the best pricing? Thank you. So what we do is essentially we, we call ourselves in a way the Metadex aggregator because we are able to send uh, not us, so we have to solve this competition, right, of the batch builders. So we have 10 different ones, I think, at the moment they are operating. And they all have different strategies, and it's completely up to them what kind of strategies they choose. Some of them are actually choosing to check their APIs from one inch, from password, from matcha and um, basically follow that execution path. So the, in the worst case scenario, we would offer prices that are, that are on par with whatever the other DEX aggregators are offering. But in a better case scenario, we are able to match you as part of one of these like peer-to-peer -peer trades, and then we can generate better prices on top. And on top of that, we are also protecting the user against MEV and so on. So there's also already now some, there's even your X perks uh, right now, trading on CowSwap, even if you would not be part of a peer-to-peer -peer trade. Um, yeah, I had a question. So I understand the, the concept of, uh, you know, how it works for an exchange. But what about applications that are not exchanges? Is there, uh, are, do you guys also have ideas how to expand that to other uh, non-exchange applications, basically? I mean, that's a super good question, but I would say that I think about 80% of MEV that is currently extracted on Ethereum is actually from DEX trades. 
So we should cover a big chunk of um, the problem at the moment. Um, I don't personally like, th this is definitely something to explore. I think there is a lot of room for innovation for other applications as well. But the biggest problem definitely is with DEXs and this is what we focus on at the moment. I'd say that probably about wraps it up. Thank you very much.